Hello, everyone, and welcome to Friends of the Force. I'm your host, Sarah. And I'm your host, Brad. And you probably didn't expect to hear my voice at the beginning of this podcast, but here we are. We like to change it up every once in a while. Uh, And on today's episode, uh, we are changing up just a little bit, too, because, yes, this is a book discussion about uh, Jedi Battle Scars by Sam Maggs, but it's also just a little bit of a discussion on the games, too. While we're here, we might as well. So, yeah, that's that's the thing. That's the thing, Brad. That is a thing. Uh, it was just yesterday, and by yesterday, I mean, like, uh, a year ago, where we were sitting in the Attack of the Clones panel at Holy Celebration, Lord. and we were like, oh, the news, the news is out. Jedi Survivor, it's happening. You know, we were like looking at our phones, no service, barely any service, couldn't load the article, but we saw the headline. Oh my we God, saw the I can't headline. it was the same time. I know. We're just was like, it? ah, we're like, ah, it's happening. And now like we're three weeks out from the game's release. As of recording. Yeah. And we'll be even closer to release after this next week at Celebration that's <laughs> ooh, okay um okay brad uh panic um wow okay yeah i guess we're here and it feels like so long ago that jedi fallen order came out but like i hold that story so close to my heart but i also have a little bit of distance from it because it has been so long and like i haven't come back and replayed it so it's so wild to be back in this world with this book but also going back to this world with jedi survivor yeah i was excited that we were getting a tie-in book because. I don't think we've had a video game tie-in book since Star Wars Inferno Squadron by Chrissy Golden, I believe. I think that was the last one, and any readers I think. can correct me if I'm wrong. Although Hunters did just come out. Oh, yeah. But that came out after Battle Scars, technically, and that, that is a, a tie-in. Uh, Battle for the Arena is another tie-in book from, from Disney Books, but this is a Del Rey tie-in uh, to Survivor, kind of links the two games together and gives you an idea of like what the mantis crew is up to in between both games and i'm all for video game tie-ins i'm all for it i think it helps to enrich the characters a little bit it helps you to get a, a feel for them because sometimes you get so wrapped up in the gameplay of it all and that player experience that i mean not to say like that detracts from the narrative at all but it's just a different type of storytelling when it's on the page versus on the screen totally and um, I don't think necessarily one medium is better than the other, but each medium can kind of do different things, right? Like you can have more of an internal thought process on the page, whereas on the screen, it's mostly what's being said to other characters, you know, unless there's a unless there is like a dialogue happening over the game. Um, a running monologue. Yeah, a running monologue. Sure. Yeah. Uh, a voiceover, like, like I guess char- is what I'm trying to say. The character walks into a room and is like, wow, this room is spooky, you know, and you're like, uh oh. <laughs> So I think uh, I was really excited to get this book and after reading it, I'm, I'm really glad they went on the adventure. I think it's like really, really fun book and we get all st- sorts of points of view in it. Um, primarily as Marin, which I thought was mm-hmm. a, a pleasant surprise because she was so absent from the survivor trailers that people started to get worried. Right, Where is Marin? Like, is she here? <laughs> Although in the most recent trailer, she did appear, which was, which was nice. So we got the Marin confirmation and she's got, she's got, a mullet haircut thing going, which new I love. Hair. Love the new hair on Marin. But I do want to uh, rewind a little bit because I know you said, well, we'll kind of talk about the games as well as the book and this discussion and, and sort of our experiences with both of those things and um, our our thoughts on the book and some of the themes that we found. But starting with Jedi Fallen Order, what was when was the first time that you found out about the game? Were you at the celebration panel? at the EA panel back in Chicago, did you make it? Or if, even if not, you know, when you got around to playing the game, like what was your experience leading up to that release? And, and as you like, what was your player experience? Like, Oh my gosh. Fall in order. I was not in the room for that game announcement. I had not even thought about that in so long, but no, I wasn't there for that. And I was, I remember like being bummed that I wasn't there because they got like a really cool poster pack. Like afterwards, it was like a poster and a pin and I wanted it. And, and a couple of my friends, like somebody handed them an extra ticket for like that one. And so they got that one. I was like, oh, I wanted it too. 
selfishly. Um, but no, I wasn't there. And I remember like being bummed that I wasn't in the room because the game sounded cool, but I was also disappointed that it was led by a white man. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that very distinctly. And, um, uh, and I, I, and I, then I was like further disappointed specifically because like the, one of the developers or head people behind it, there was an article that came out and he like so said something along the lines of, we thought about making it like a woman main character or like an alien main character, but we decided not to go with like a woman main character because there was like already Ray leading the movies. And I, yeah. I will like never not be mad about that. <laughs> like we've, it's we've just hit our those- allotted one woman character right, that right. is allowed um, to you know headline something sarcasm yeah yeah, yeah. And, 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 not a great not a great quote not a great anyway. quote by any stretch anyways anyway. but we do love Cal Kestis um, and we love where I, the I, game oh ended oh, up. oh yeah. yeah totally like yeah. I I was I love Cal Kestis and I was at C2E2 uh yesterday as a recording and I saw two Cal's and one of them has, she had a BD um on on like her back oh, wow. and i was we walked behind her for, like to get you know it was so busy but we like walked get back to the booth where i was working and um there she was and we were following her and i was just like losing my mind over this beauty droid but like very silently <laughs> i was like i love you i love you bd i love you cal Kestos. um so it was cool to see cal Kestos cosplayers in real life um but yeah no i love cal and um Cam Monaghan is is great and I'm so glad that he's a part of the Star Wars universe like I will eat my disappointment eat my words on that because um I'm delighted that he is the main character of these stories and um is back for another one um in terms of like playing the game I really don't have so many memories of that I know I completed it I have memories of like sitting down and playing the game but I couldn't have told you when it happened um but you know I was delighted of course um that we went to Kashyyyk yeah, and Tarful. Is, Tarful and was Tarful? there. And Tarful? Okay, don't get me started. Um, and then Sumali Montano was um, also a character on the Kashyyyk map. So it was cool you got to talk to her. And so that was really cool. Um, I loved how expansive the world was. And I love the story that we went on with Cal. It was uh, so rich and and interesting and sad with Trilla and Seer. Um, yeah, I, I, I have such fond memories of the game. And even though I haven't gone back and played it since I originally did, cause I'm not a huge gamer. Um, whenever I like see a cutscene or watch a little bit of gameplay or like think about these characters, it's so easy for me to fall back into the story and like get reminded of how much I love these characters. Um, and yes, uh, my lightsaber when I could customize it was made of hazy and smelt thank Mm. you uh yeah i loved the first game i remember the night before it came out well one i got into the panel at celebration that was like one of the few that i showed up for hours early because i was like i gotta get in uh and it ended up having plenty of space I, i probably didn't need to line up like three hours before it opened uh, but we ended up being on the sh- on the floor, like three rows behind Janina Gavankar, which was like kind of surreal. Oh, Janina. Uh, and then the group that I went in with, like literally two seats away from me, some guy won like the exclusive Fallen Order Xbox. So like if I were just sitting like two seats to the left, I would have won an Xbox and like been, up sta- been on stage with the Purge Troopers. But, you know, I'm not salty about it still. It's fine. Uh, anyways, he's fine, guys. He's fine. <laughs> it came with an exclusive backpack to hold your Xbox in. Anyways, your Xbox backpack. That's anyways, right. I need an Xbox backpack. But once I got to the game, uh, I think I changed my time on my Xbox to be like British time, and then like it moved forward five hours, and then like I was able to play the game <laughs> a little bit early. <laughs> yeah, because I just changed. You know, almost region locked my Xbox by accident. It's fine. Uh, but I got to play the game and I, you know, started playing it a day early. And uh, that was actually a pro tip from Eric Eilerson over at Utini. He told me that one. So I blame him. for. So Eric almost got your yes. Xbox region locked. I yes. think I remember this whole saga, actually, of like everybody changing the time on their <laughs> Xboxes. But it was like, but you can only do it twice before, you know, yes. your Xbox yeah. gets locked out forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was fun. But. Yeah, the gaming experience was awesome. I, I put a lot of hours into that game. I think the the skill trees that you had for Cal mm, and, mm-hmm. you know, the Mantis as like your home base where you could meditate and see the skill tree like on the floor and right. um, getting to just like walk around the ship and 
uh, throw stormtroopers off cliffs and do fun things like, you know, force pull them and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and, you know, fighting the Haxion brood as you go throughout the game. All that was a lot of fun. The environments were massive. I wish there were more fast travel points and I hope the <laughs> the next the next game has more of those because I will say that was like the one struggle is like, oh, I got to run all the way back to the Mantis. It's like so far away. And then someone put the who's game down. not good at this. <laughs> I did have to I, I do remember like ha- I'm like okay I, I have to turn it off like I'm not getting anywhere because I can't figure out this map to get back to where I need to get back to because I've taken a wrong path I just remember like opening up the map you know in the map view and then be like six levels of all the you know the things you've explored and be like map 80% complete and you're like where have I not gone where have I not gone <laughs> at this point like some like, random I, like, cave with a chest right, in it or something right of course that has like a like a there's an achievement unlock or like a memory in there that you can go and then you're like, okay, I need to find it out so I can get like the, the, the memory to add to the the collection um, that tells right. the story. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I also feel like in the game, um, when you were on Zepho, right? Bogano. Yeah. Bogano is the outdoor, the outdoor planet pretty, where you're, you can like fall down through the sky almost like there's like big open gaps. You have to like jump yeah. over them. And, yeah. Zepho, that was where you were like underground, right? With the big species. So that one gave me like big halo vibes, <laughs> that planet, um, like halo four. Um, and I really enjoyed that as like somebody who's enjoyed the halo games. Um, just kind of like the way that the puzzles were working and the way that those characters looked gave me that vibe of like, I think the forerunners. Um, mm. I'm like pulling all these memories out of my head of my gaming days a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, and then we got to go to what? Dathomir and Kashyyyk, Ogano, Zepho. Yeah, there were some really good planets. Dathomir always kind of terrified me because of the, you know, the, the risen dead that would like chase you and they had the glowing yes. green eyes that was always terrifying but obviously it's where we meet Marin. so uh what was what was initially a bad thing became a good thing and we added a member to the mantis crew which is very good oh and then also ilum i can't forget about oh yeah which we ilum. found out like kind of was star killer base remember that whole fiasco yeah. where people were People finally saw it from space, like loading in and had like the stripped out middle part. And we were like, uh, uh, and then huh? what, what, where did it, when did it get, oh, cause it, oh, it's Starkiller basically got blown up. I don't think that's been like officially confirmed, but like no, it's literally it's, looks the same. Like, I know it, it, we're going to, we're going to find that out right now. Okay. Which is, which is, is tragic. Star killer. Wait, star killer base is Ilum star killer base. Starkiller Base was the first order military base located on the ice planet of Ilum in the known unknown regions in Wikipedia. Something confirmed it. Oh, Rise of Skywalker Visual Dictionary. The Vizdek. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, it's gone now, but I like sliding down the ice slides in Ilum is the point what I was trying to say. Anyway, I could I could kind of just like resurrect these memories all all the time. Um, but you mentioned like adding Marin to the crew, and um, I think that's like, like a really key point as we go into Jedi Battle Scars and like talk about the book a little bit. Um, she is a really really key character, if not the main character of. Jedi Battle Scars, which I think was a really interesting surprise for us as readers, um, kind of expecting more of Cal's story, um, but kind of getting to delight a bit in Marin's story because we wanted more from Marin since we met her. Mm-hmm. And Sam Maggs has also said that Marin's her favorite character. So if she were ever to have written a Star Wars book, like that would be the one she wanted. And, you know, she finally got to do that, which is exciting. And um, it is interesting, you know, because like on the surface, I think the you look at the book cover and you think it's going to kind of uh, maybe be Cal focus because like Marin's kind of in the corner on the book cover. And so it was like a surprise and then like get into it and be like, oh, no, she's like a huge part of the story. She's not just like relegated to the background, which I like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's still so much of every other point of view within this. Like we get Seer, we get uh, Grease. And and Cal, a little bit of the fifth brother, too, which was uh, a fun surprise and like a little bit of mm-hmm. 
maybe what to expect with Delilah's book later this summer when we we get a full on Inquisitor point of view for like an entire a whole ass book, basically, <laughs> which will be exciting. Uh, but what did you think of of Battle Scars overall, like kind of from a high level overview? Like, what are your thoughts? How are you feeling coming out of it? And also just like now looking forward to Survivor, having read the story. Yeah, I think I mentioned it a little bit on our interview with Sam Mags, which if you haven't checked out, we we did have an interview with Sam Mags and it was so fun to talk with her and just hear all her thoughts behind the book. Um, so find that on our feed because it is there. Um, but I think the thing that I mentioned there was like, this book was so easy to kind of fall back into these characters and fall back into this, this world. Um, I think that she wrote the book with like a really uh, modern, accessible language and style that it felt like you could just jump right back in in a very casual way with these characters so i i really enjoyed that um and i would say that like my experience with the book overall is is positive and it's a fun fast-paced adventure so it moves quickly um which i enjoyed because it felt like it matched the pace of the games when i wasn't getting lost you know like in the caverns on the third level below where the mantis is <laughs> um because otherwise like the, the the game's story um has a lot of depth and a lot of thought but it also moves pretty quick when the action goes and that's what the story is is like the action side of that um and also getting to explore a bit of character within that so um yeah i i had a good time and i really liked diving into the various points of view because in the game you we were talking about this like in the game you only get cal's point of view and even then, it's only when he is deciding to give some soliloquies um, or in dialogue with other characters. And we don't necessarily get any other character's point of view because we aren't playing as them. Um, so that I, I thought it was really cool to get Marin's point of view specifically, as well as our other members of the crew and um, the fifth brother. Yeah, I thought the book did a great job of like translating the combat, especially onto the page. Like, I, I think there were a couple points where I was reading the book and i'm like oh yeah like i know that move or like yeah i can i can visualize that completely and i think that's also a testament to sam mags's style and the fact that she has written for video games before and she's written like comic adaptations of of video games so um that is definitely a strength of hers i think the book is also very funny um which mm -hmm. is another testament to her she uh really instilled a lot of lightheartedness i think in a time when the mantis crew is probably facing the most dangerous uh of situations and the odds are kind of stacked against them and i think uh i think it i think it struck a pretty good balance of you know not being too lighthearted to feel like unserious you know um which is not something that you want from you know this sort of time period it's it's you know mm -hmm. dangers lurk around every corner um so i think i think she did a great job there and then I think having Marin's perspective uh, was, like we said, a welcome surprise. And I'm hoping that we get to play as Marin in Survivor because there was that sort of gameplay trailer recently where we saw her and Cal kind of doing some things in sync with each other. So I'm wondering if there's going to be uh, maybe some parts of the game where you play as Marin. I know like sometimes games do that, like the Spider-Man game, you are playing as Peter Parker but there's like a mission or two where you play as uh, Mary Jane or like in last mm. of us there you play as Joel, but sometimes you play as Ellie. So that would be kind of cool. Like to maybe have a multiple point of view player experience uh, in the game. But I think also like notably for this book is the uh, queer representation that we got in diving in and exploring Marin's pansexuality, I think was really a wonderful mm -hmm thing because queer representation has been severely lacking on screen in star wars but i think books have been a great source of uh showing those stories and showing like how we can be represented within those stories um for all walks of life and that is important to keep in mind as we try to evolve the medium uh within star wars and uh, i hope the movies eventually movies and tv catch up to the books eventually um, but the books have been great. And I think this was just like another addition to that to make people feel seen. Uh, mm -hmm. And also just like a genuinely very hot, steamy book. Like there are some <laughs> there are some moments, capital that M is, moments in here that are great. That is true. Yeah, I will say I think like the representation is is um, really you, the point you make is really valid. And like the books have been a great source 
for this representation um, throughout like High Republic and and this. Uh, but it does feel like everywhere else needs to catch up. And I hope that by continuing to include queer rep in um, the books, like everyone else will start to catch on in other medium uh, mediums of Star Wars storytelling. That's my hope anyway. Um, but it definitely feels like it's, it's too late already um, in terms of like, guys, we could have been doing this. Anyway, point being, um, I, I agree that like, I think Marin's point of view and her story within this book is really valid and, and really important. And you're right. This book is kind of horny. Um, it's, it's really got an energy about it. And, um, and I, I never expect it when it comes to Star Wars. I never do. It's such a, it's often such a chaste, you know, non-romantic uh, space. And then we had Elzar Man, and everybody was like shooketh out of their mind. Um, and Brad will never stop talking about it. So I'm surprised I'm the one that brought talking it up about today. Talking about what? When yep. his pants came off and that's Bala right. got attacked? Yes. That's that's right. Just yep. want to give uh-huh. the specifics because you were kind of yeah, skirting around yeah. when the he details. When he decided when he decided to sleep <laughs> with the reporter on Valo, uh, the night of the attack. I mean, that's his choice, but the timing was a little poor. Um, anyway, so like I. I uh, find it really interesting when, when Star Wars decides to lean into the romance, into the sexuality, into um, some some of the horniness of of life, as it were. Um, <laughs> considering the stories, even the romances have often been, um, you know, pretty pretty minimal, even when the story exists throughout multiple like uh, movies or whatever. Anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything more to say about that. I'm just going to go anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And speaking a little bit to the just the steaminess real quick, too, there were a couple parts that really stuck out to me. <laughs> I think when I first realized that this book would be steamy and very hot, I was like, oh, it was the moment when uh, Marin first meets Fret and like clicks off her helmet, like with her fingers. And yeah. like <laughs> it's like very slow and methodical. And, you know, she's like, maybe I do like playing with my food after all like you learn something new about yourself every day i'm like whoa 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 uh so that was fun and also the fact that marin at one point thinks uh she wants uh she wants fret's thighs to crush her head clean off which i was like who among us who among us has not felt that thought you know you know Felt it for the last three weekends, seeing all right. the Taylor Swift photos on on tour. Right. Yeah. And and it's you're great. like Brad to me the other day was like, I don't <laughs> I don't think I'll ever get K-pop. And and then and then you posted that photo or that video of Taylor Swift. And then I was like Brad, that video that I shared with you of the one only one of them are is exactly the same way that you feel about that, <laughs> that video about Taylor Swift. We're really going through it right now. Um, We're trying. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> we're surviving we're thriving it's fine um uh we just i guess aren't the chair in in taylor swift's video unfortunately <laughs> as not. you meant as you said <laughs> um anyways. anyways um okay i did want to bring up because you mentioned you know the way that this, we both mentioned like the way that the story is told and also just the the way that like marin's attraction and Marin's sexuality is talked about and experienced in this book. It does feel like this book's style and um, writing are neither, you know, like neither YA nor adult in what we would typically expect for either of the genre. Like um, it feels like this book really, I, I, I hesitate to say new adult because like if you're a book person, that category is a complicated and has a complicated history because it's like not widely accepted and like it, anyway the definition is neither here nor there anyway it doesn't feel like this book squarely fits in a YA space and it's definitely a, a published as an adult novel but it doesn't feel like it is like an adult adult novel with capital A's um in terms of like the maturity of the characters or the way that it's written so it does feel like it's somewhere in the middle. And I like that we're getting that somewhere in the middle because I feel like it is a space that's not often tread. Um, like something like Alphabet Squadron, that's definitely like very dense, uh, very adult. Um, it's heavy. Um, 
and that's, these are all things I'm saying complimentary. That's like one of my favorite books ever, but like, you know, it's definitely a big task to read. And then even something like Rising Storm is definitely adult in the way that it has the action. And like, you know, you're not going to give that to your 13 year old generally, probably (laughs) do whatever you want as a parent, but like, I might not give it to (laughs) my They might be traumatized at the end. It's fine. (laughs) You know, kids read things that they shouldn't probably yet be reading all the time then and they live but like i don't know if i were the parent i would maybe not give it there anyway not the point um but it's also not you know uh queen's peril which is like on the younger side of ya writing um or you know some of the other ya books that are on the the younger side of ya the the 12 13 14 year olds as opposed to the 16 17 18 year olds that the genre or the category typically calls for and this feels like it is for someone like me who is you know in their mid-20s and is wanting that like beach read sort of energy to a book so where it has that fast pace it's it's easy to crack open and enjoy but also some of the level of depth of the characters when it comes to what they're experiencing, what they're encountering, um, and the stakes. So I don't know if that makes a lot of sense and may not everyone may agree with me, but that was what I was thinking, you know, kind of about the book's level as I put it next to other like Star Wars adult books on my shelf. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the book is definitely intelligent and has a lot to say, but I think saying that it's like, uh, maybe a quick and easy read is not, it's not to its detriment, right? It's, I think accessibility is such a good thing for books and not every book has to be like the most amazing thing you've ever read or whatever, you know, like I think it serves the purpose that it wants to, it connects to video games and reintegrates us into this world with these characters to give us a glimpse into their lives and like what they've been doing and what they've been striving for and and sort of being the strike team that tries to crack away at the empire like slowly over time and weaken them at the at their foundation uh and it like i think the book achieves exactly what it wants to do and, and you know not that it's without criticism and what people might be thinking about it but um i i really enjoyed it i had a good time with it and uh, I think there were just a lot of moments where I felt like, yeah, I'm so happy to be back with these characters and I forgot mm-hmm. how much I love them. And it's Sam Maggs's writing that's reminding me of why I fell in love with this crew in the first place. Right. It's like Grease's one liners. It's Marin's sort of uh, apathy slash uh, indifference towards Cal while also like appreciating him, you know, uh, and it's Cal like making fun of an Inquisitor's helmet because it looks funny and he's like does that keep the rain from hitting your face you know like stuff like that um and then seer sort of being the the parent the most parental figure of the group uh i think she's going through quite a lot and this kind of leads us into like some of the themes of the book but um seeing her sort of put things in the perspective for herself and like what she wants and like what the end game is and i think that's a lot of what our characters are experiencing if you want to move into sort of the overarching big themes here if you have anything else to say before that yeah no i think that's that's definitely where we should head because um i think it's one thing to exist in this time period and and just kind of like do adventure of the week you know if that makes sense and just kind of follow characters within this time period who are just like struggling to live every day and are going on adventures it's another thing to like take a step back and consider what the end game is here. What's the goal? What's the point? Um, why are we doing the things that we're doing every day? You know? Um, so, uh, I think for me, like the key idea of this book, which was talked about a lot in this book, and I know it's kind of talked about in some ways in the fallen order, but like the goals change over time. Like Sears goal changes once spoilers obviously okay yeah actually spoiler spoilers for fallen order and battle scars from here forward i would say right so so if you haven't played the game or read the book this is your time to probably skip out if you don't want to know more but like when seer loses trilla like her goal throughout the book or throughout the game in some way is trilla right um and when she loses trilla She's got to reassess what it means to be her in this world. And I think that like what Sam does a good job of in this book is like really 
having the characters question their identity and their place in the world in a world that has changed on them. You know, um, w- once Cal was a Jedi and now he is one of the only Jedi. And what does it mean to have that responsibility? And I think that's exactly what Seer is feeling. And she's like, you know, what is my legacy as a master? What is my legacy as a teacher? What is my legacy as a Jedi? And I think for Cal, he's feeling some of that too. Like, what is my, what is my goal as like a leader of this team? Uh, or, well, you know, I think they're all kind of leaders in their own way, but like a, a leader of this team and our main character um, for Marin, you know, what does it mean for her family to be gone and her world to be gone and uh, for her to be alone and to balance these like really tough emotions that war within her. Um, so like, I think for those characters, it like, who am I in a world that I no longer recognize in a world that I continue to no longer recognize because it keeps getting worse. That's what it feels like. And I think we get there by the end of the book in terms of a, a, resol- a resolution of spirit at the very least, and maybe a per- of purpose as well. Yeah. And especially, I think especially for Marin, because uh, in some ways Marin is the odd one out because she's with two Jedi and the Jedi are all about, you know, you, you can't, dwell on your anger because anger leads to hate and hate leads to suffering all that stuff right and you have to put all that behind you and there's a couple parts within the book where she feels like even if she were to go to cal and seer to discuss her feelings they might they might advocate for her to sort of come to peace with those things and move forward but like she feels that she can't throw those feelings aside and like push forward because like she still feels angry and she wants to be angry about what happened on Dathomir and what General Grievous did to her people and the separatists and striking back at the empire feels like kind of getting back at the at the people who drove her from her home and took everything away from her. So, you know, when she meets Fret, Fret is somebody who she can vent out her resentment and her frustration towards and Fret will listen because Fret is also angry about all the things that she has had to go through like um what she thought was losing Irie and um being in the empire kind of against her will in many ways and now uh trying to get back the shroud you know and there's a lot on her plate and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that's why her and fret bond so easily um Mm -hmm. and i think that's just it's an interesting it's interesting when you're trying to find your purpose but you're trying to also like piece together the broken parts of yourself you know because there's there's one thing where you can like feel like you're put together and you're trying to discover that. But like when you're also shattered into a million pieces and trying to also figure out what you want to do in your life, like that's even harder. And I think that's where Marin is uh, in this book. And I think a lot of characters are feeling shattered, right? The book's called Battle Scars. Like what are what are the battle scars of each of these characters? Like you said, you know, Seer lost Trilla, Marin lost Dathomir, Cal lost the Jedi Order, uh, Grease. Grease is just kind of getting by, but also like he's like he was a former gambler and he knows what taking a bad bet looks like because he's been there mm. once or twice. Mm-hmm. And he keeps wondering when is our when is our losing bet gonna be? Like when is the bet that kind of pushes us too far and we the odds are stacked against us and we lose a gamble and one of us dies because of it, right? And so it's like Cal, like what's your end goal here? Because I, I want to right. retire and open a restaurant. That's that's <laughs> what I want to do. I want to live to see that. But I'm not quite sure we're going to get there if this is sort of if if we're all in on the empire. Like, do we really all share the same goals? Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's a key thing for them to figure out, because at this point, like, as I've been mentioning with Mission of the Week, they've been doing this for a couple of years. They've been going on these missions. They've been surviving and um, doing what they need to do. But like, when does it stop or when how can we? how can we move forward beyond this? Um, and I think that's a really interesting question for them to ask themselves. And the answer is like, bro, I don't know, man, the galaxy is a scary place at this point. Um, for a lot of people, uh, them included. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bit bleak in that sense. Um, but also like, I think the resolution of purpose and the resolution of spirit and them kind of all figuring out where they want to go and, and who they want to be is like really valuable. And also leads us into not you know from jedi fallen order to jedi battle scars to jedi survivor there's um there's a certain tenacity to the way that those titles flow um that i like a lot not important but like you know no definitely important 
Yeah, I you have know. the you have the you have like the low point, you know, the the remembrance and perseverance over that low point and then you end up being a survivor from that low point that you experience. Like you move past those mistakes or that trauma that you had to overcome and I think in many ways like um we should talk about Marin I think a little bit here cuz like Marin I think is the is the key person that overcomes so much in this um because she feels so disconnected to herself and it's ironic too because like part of her abilities is to literally disappear and like disassociate mm-hmm, <laughs> from like mm-hmm. thin air and become invisible and the ways in which like Sam Mags describes that power I think was so like beautiful and like tragic in a way because it's 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 described as like every nerve in her body like burning and searing her away into nothingness you know and it's like yeah disappear you know disappearing into thin air is like sleeping and that you have no memory of that consciousness and there's not really a feeling of a physical form and your brain doesn't record any physical experiences so it says here quote you simply are not and then you are right uh and so disappearing for her is like this this rush it's the only thing that kind of makes her feel uh like she's alive in some ways and like the only thing that still comes naturally to her because she's still struggling with all of her other powers besides that singular one right and and i think meeting fret was like for the first time oh i am seen like i don't Mm -hmm. have to disappear i don't have to disappear like kind of metaphorically you know like speaking I'm I'm here. I'm a I'm a person. I have feelings and I have experience I have lived experiences and I'm I can be physical with another person, right? Like they get physical, you know, as Cal walks by the door and goes, Wow, Marin's really doing her magic well today. She's been in there for hours. Like he's kind of clueless in some ways, by the way. He's just so silly. Yeah. yeah. Like, Cal, Cal, read between the lines, buddy. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> um <laughs> I think like you, you hit on something interesting here, which is like the feeling seen versus not existing or not knowing who the person inside yourself is. Right. And having fret and like actually being able to be seen. Like, I think it's really important to note that, um, like for Cal and Seer and Marin, it's not like happy go lucky. We're besties five ever. Like Cal obviously feels strongly about Marin and that's something we see throughout the book. And like, as a, also as a Cal Marin shipper, it's, it's, it's real, it's real. But like, we know that the, the Jedi and on, on, in this crew and Marin as a night sister, there's a little bit of tension there just because of who they are. Um, and so I think to kind of not have that tension playing in the background of her relationship with Fret necessarily. Um, is is a bit freeing for her that she doesn't have to think of herself with that wall up. Yeah, it is interesting because uh it's she lives a complicated life because like she has lost so much, but she's also found so much through the Mantis crew, right? Mm-mm. Um and made her feel like that something was uh something was possible where she felt like there was no hope, like she could find a family again. Um and that ultimately at the end of the day, like the Mantis crew is all about found family it's these broken people coming together and figuring out how to move forward with each other that's so star wars Marin (laughs) has to work past like so much of her anger right and that anger is personified like with her green her green fire right like Mm -hmm. her use of it in this book becomes very intense she is literally like wrapping green fire around people's necks and like choking them and she's rising uh people from the dead and there's a couple points where like cal seems a little worried about her and like she even recognizes that worry of like okay you know this is the moment where cal realizes this is too much for him and you know i'm left alone again right like this is where i'm I'm kicked out of the group because i'm out of control right um and it's so interesting though that her fire um you know initially she's thinking about it and it's it's this thing that she thinks of as like rabid and hungry and it knows no limits and it eats until it runs out of fuel basically. And uh, then eventually she's using her fire to heal Irie, like when Irie gets mm-hmm. hurt. Um, mm-hmm. And so what was this thing that was like kind of destructive for her then becomes this thing that uh, is healing and brings life, you know, kind of similar to what the Night Sisters did. 
uh, back on Dathomir when they brought like Darth Maul to life, right? Like they used the fires and they brought him to a new state of being. So it's like fire ha- the Dathomirian fire has these interesting properties where it can destroy, but it can create. Uh, and for her to sort of find that in this book and like rediscover that, rekindle that connection to the fire in like a new way and like repurpose it for something good speaks a little bit to her journey is like you know i was in a bad place but now i'm in a better place here and i feel like there are things out there for myself that i want in the universe and that i can have uh and that i like i shouldn't just be defined with my past and like to relish on that anger like i have to move beyond that anger the fire can be more than destructive right the fire inside me can be more than like poison it just it's not going to just like poison me all the time now you know i can actually like use it for good maybe there's this great quote from Marin in the book and it just says, I think, I believe it's to fret if I recall correctly, but it's, you've brought me back to myself in a way that I did not think was possible. Again, I lost sight of myself of the core of who I am meeting you, getting to know you, seeing myself through your eyes. I felt like I'm starting to feel my, find myself a little again to know that there are things out in the universe I can find and have for myself and that have nothing to do with my past that make up the core of me piece by piece things just beyond the mantis, things beyond just the anger I've guided myself by. I think that that's clearly like summing up what you have explained here, Brad. And, and I think that quote is so powerful because she's so tied to her past with the mantis crew because they are kind of the people who brought her in. Right. Um, and yes, their family and yes, they're good. And, um, they'll support her even though there's a little bit of tension based on who they are in the world and all that. But like, she also needs to be able to establish her own identity and, and write, or like have her own journey of self-discovery again and be able to rebuild herself on her own. And I think like her meeting friend and having this experience, as we see in this quote, is like really important. And I also think like this quote, uh, like Sam talked a bit about like her personal identity in um in our interview with her. And like, this is a quote that absolutely very much. So I think is one that can resonate with queer people in our real world. It, um, it hits, it hits as they Mm -hmm. say, uh, just meeting you, getting to know you and seeing myself through your eyes. I felt like I'm starting to find myself a little again. I think like that is really, really important and valuable. And I just, I like that quote a lot. That's it. Off the soapbox. <laughs> yeah. I want to I wanna hone in on one of the pieces in that quote, which is uh, piece by piece. That was like a pretty prominent phrase that was spoken. And it's also one of the final lines of the book. And we'll, this will kind of translate over to Cal's experience. But um, her and Cal squeeze hands at the end, you know, like one. And they say one day at a time, piece by piece, you know, uh, moving forward like they're gonna figure it out one way or another and um i'm also a cal marin shipper so that was nice to have a little bit of a crumb at the end there although there were several crumbs throughout this book i gotta say their their relationship is so funny uh cal's yeah. like i'm kind of into you and marin's like i'm 100 percent into fret and at the end is like uh, maybe i'm also just into you a little bit too we're kind, we're well then together. even fret is like i see the way cal looks at you and then Marin's like no he's that way with everybody right right and fret's like okay you are <laughs> blind clearly <laughs> i am pro Marin having multiple relationships you know Same. she can have an ex and she can have a current and that's okay that's great i, I support her in that endeavor date cal yeah <laughs> I'm like typically just like pro ship everybody together because like the points don't matter and I love kissing and hugging and let's see more of it. Clearly. Uh, yeah. I support the romance. Yeah, totally. I may not have a romance in my life, but I will live vicariously <laughs> by shipping everybody else's. Yes. <laughs> all the fictional characters with all the fictional characters. Well, why not? The world is our oyster. Uh, That's right. But this piece by piece quote, uh, it ties back to one of my favorite parts of the book, which is a conversation between cal and seer and it's after the whole inquisitor fiasco uh and grease loses his arm which you know Mm. we just saw the recent gameplay trailer and he's got the metal arm now uh which i love that connective tissue um but you probably won't recognize me with with the metal (laughs) arm (laughs) with the metal arm (laughs) oh my gosh uh he needs that extra arm to pour all the salt on his food that's for sure he needs he needs as much salt as possible Four right, right, arms, right. four jars of salt at all times. Just dumping at it all, all times, every yes. time. Yeah. But they're having this conversation about 
like what is the purpose of our mission and seer thinks it's about the legacy and like cal thinks it's about like getting you know striking at the empire and like taking them out you know and it's this idea of like what is our future you know like how much of our future should we be focused on when we're still trying to like live in the moment right and i think you Mm -hmm. can get so caught up with like what that future might look like that you sort of forget the journey on how to get there and you don't see like uh i'm trying to think of like the ram jam ram quote again from the high republic right like the part for the part the whole for the whole in right? each part and, for the role it plays not for what right. you want it to be not for what it, or not for what you hope it to be but for what it is i think that's yeah. almost right <laughs> yeah exactly so um again we're thinking of like piece by piece in mind right and so Seer is saying, you know, it's the future Cal, but it's also now like people and symbols, the first step to rebuilding something that people can look at, that people who need help and hope can look at and say, Mm. this is a thing that exists. It has existed and will continue to exist. Um, And and then Cal talks about this lesson that he got from Jarl to Paul, which was like when he would get really uh, he would get this like incredibly tedious task for Cal to figure out. And Cal is somebody who, like, when he gets overwhelmed, he just sort of, sorts of, uh, sort of shuts down. And to Paul, basically told him, like, when that happens, just like think of it like one piece at a time, basically, right? Mm-hmm. That's his lesson to Cal is one piece at a time. And that's where I think, that's where I think things get a little complicated for Sears' mission, you know, because I think she's in such a rush in some ways to create this like new legacy. Uh, and mm. that in some ways, maybe she's not as much focused on the now as as the future and like the idealized future that she has in her mind. Whereas on the flip side, like Cal is so focused on the now that he's not focused on like what that future could look like. Um, right. I don't know if this is right. making sense, but like they're sort of yeah. like prioritizing like different aspects of the same journey. And like ultimately, like they both need to just like be focused on one piece at a time. And they need to just like take it one step at a time. Like you can't focus too much on the future. You can't stew too much in the present. Like you need to have an idea of where you want to be, but like recognize that every piece of the journey is important and that like it provides something and that you can't like rush that process. Right. I I think that like Sears um, kind of just talking about like her search for artifacts and her like real strong desire to leave something a specific symbol for people to rally around um she she goes cal listen to me you're a highly motivated person it comes from within you but not everyone is quite the same way there are people who can't fight for a thing unless they have a symbol people who can't look forward without being first able to look back if we don't preserve jedi history how will we learn from the past and i like think that that question if we don't preserve the history how will we learn i think that's like really important actually very important um, yeah uh we go we we fast forward hit the fast forward button and we go all the way to the last jedi and you know my bestie luke skywalker goes the legacy of the jedi is failure (laughs) yeah um and obviously like the jedi he's speaking from a, a very particular place when he says that but like the Jedi time and time again failed to learn from their past and then failed because of it. Um, and, and so I think that's a valid point, but I think what Sierra is doing here, there are people who can't fight for a thing unless they have a symbol. She's trying to force a legacy. She's trying to, to create something artificial in a sense. But why we know by the time of The Last Jedi, right, um, Luke Skywalker has his big battle and then he's immediately talked about as a legend among the youth. The next generation already knows, right? Legacy, as they say in Hamilton, um, is planting seeds in a garden that you do not get to see, right? Like um, setting things in motion and then not knowing what the next generation will do with them and hoping that they succeed. Right. And I think that Seer here is she's so focused on her future and so focused on this one task that like, she is not, she's not organically planting those seeds. She's trying to build the flower. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? I don't know. And I think like that's her downfall on that side. Well, I think forcing something that is artificial as well, like leads to the incident with the Inquisitor when she's like, I can fix him, you know, because right, right. she sees the grievances of her past and like what happened to Trilla. And she's like, well, maybe I can 
take what I couldn't do then and do it now. And like, if I can rescue this guy, then it's like, now we have a purpose. We can help people like him. And that helps to establish our legacy as Jedi is like, there is hope for everybody, no matter how far off the path you've strayed. But like her aim in that moment is not quite appropriate and it almost costs them much more than just the mission. Right. Right. Um, And so I think she's a bit, I, I think her, like her, her goal is uh inspiring and like what she wants to do but like at the same time you're right like she's she's a little bit in over her head i think in some ways and when you think about luke and the last jedi like think about his isolation and like all that he wanted to do in rebuilding the order and like where does that get him like literally in a hut on octo with all of the artifacts that he has collected to try to rebuild the Mm -hmm. order you know like the compass from uh battlefront 2 that he gets and all these other like little small trinkets you know like the books yeah the sacred texts and like where does that get him the books just burn right because like (laughs) oh they didn't they didn't but he thinks they did yeah yeah well as as much as people like need symbols like people don't need objects to symbolize like the hope of everything in the world right like she thinks she needs this this crown like she she thinks she needs it to remain a symbol and to build a legacy but it's like a legacy is much more than just just uh artifacts and a like legacy, physical tangible things yeah like a legacy can be a feeling you know and i think that like we talk so much and obvious for obvious reasons about hope in star wars um but that that is what a legacy is right like a legacy can be that hope um the the legend of luke skywalker as a a young man is the way that he inspires hope in Ray when she goes to meet him and he's like, you're Luke Skywalker, you know, that's you. Um, so I, I, I think it's more about the actions than it is about the thing. It's not a, some, (laughs) this is, this is a, this is a statement I'm about to say. Some may disagree, but it's not about the, freaking skywalker saber being repaired you know like it's not about the symbol it's about the feeling and it's about right. the action anyway yeah totally i uh i remember when i was covering um basketball at, in college and uh talking to like the coach one time and she had made this comment that's always stuck with me is like uh your legacy or like how how you remembered is not like based on how many baskets you shot or like how many layups you had or rebounds right it's like how you made people on the team feel like that's right. how you remember. And that's like, it's 100%. so, it's so true. Um, and just thinking of like things as tangible or untangible and like, it is something that is tangible more, uh, more readily able to create a legacy. Like Luke Skywalker is literally a projection when he fights right. Kylo Ren. Like he is not tangible in that moment. He is not a physical being. He is projecting himself across the galaxy. He's projecting an image, something that, uh something that is like fake it's like a fake image of who he is but it's the image that he wants people to remember and feel like when they think of him they want them to feel like ah oh, yeah luke looks so heroic like he didn't look disheveled he didn't look like he's been sitting on an island for like 25 years and like stewing in his thoughts like no he looks like the luke skywalker that i always felt like was a hero growing up right right and i think that's right. the point so many people miss with the last jedi is like luke doesn't need to take down all those ad ads like he just needs to make people feel hope uh and that is like all he needs to do in that moment right um and so yeah i think as we talk about feeling versus versus objects and tangible things i think that's so uh such a great example and also just like you know the genius of the last jedi uh and And we will bring it up every time we will but it it relates great to this because I, i do i do see like some of the mistakes of luke through like what seer is trying to achieve right oh, like totally. luke was so caught up in the legacy of the jedi uh that he ends up realizing that the legacy is just failure and that's it like i i was kind of chasing a ghost that means nothing now it's just just well, it's just trinkets in my closet now at this point i i think i think that he i, I as i said earlier like i think he's coming from a very specific place when he says that um of yes of, personal defeat and like not being able to overcome that um i don't i don't know if i actually think like the legacy of the jedi is failure i think the legacy of the jedi is more than that um but i think in the eyes of somebody who has experienced that failure very directly and has lost his own hope within that that makes a lot of sense that he would say that 
Yeah, like, I don't know totally. if I believe it, but like I believe. Yeah, him yeah. Saying it's it, you know, it's it's definitely more ambiguous and, and complex than just that. But failure is definitely an element of their legacy. But it's not the entire. Oh, yeah. it's not the entire legacy itself for sure. Right, right, right. Anyway, <laughs> we've been having this conversation about, you know, I mentioned up top about this theme of like identity and knowing yourself and your purpose in a world that's changed and is changing, right? And I think we've been talking about that with. Uh, Marin and with Seer attempting to to establish something. Um, and I think Cal like has an important role to play within that self as as a leader, as a as a Jedi, as somebody who is a survivor. Um and and off air we were talking about this quote that uh in the book. And I, I just would like you to talk about it a little bit because you're gonna say more in, in, in a, you're gonna say it in a better fashion than I can. So yeah, Grease asks Cal, uh, you know, if you, if you had the choice again, like, would you want to be born a Jedi? Like knowing everything that happened to you and like knowing where it landed you now. And, uh, I'll just put it here. Quote, at one time, Cal thought that being a Jedi was the worst thing that had ever happened to him. And I felt less like an opinion and more like a fact. It had ruined his life, set him on the run as a child, denied him a home, stability, safety, taken from him everyone that he'd ever cared about. It made him a fugitive, a criminal. He lived in his life in half. He lived his life in half measures in the shadows. But the real truth, the raw truth of it, at Cal's very core, being a Jedi was the best thing that had ever happened to Cal. He loved it, even when the galaxy told him he shouldn't. Told him he should hide. There was more to Cal than his connection to the Force. It wasn't the most interesting thing about him, nor should it have been. But it was Cal's favorite thing about himself. This connection to something greater than his own soul, his own spirit. It gave him purpose. For all the pain and all the fear, mostly, mostly it brought him joy. It brought Cal his family, these people he had found whom he loved better than anyone else he had ever known, and it brought him the ability to help others who needed it, gave his life meaning, and it felt really, really good. And beautiful. It's beautiful, right? Because it's such an interesting question to think of like, okay, if a Jedi, like knowing Order 66 would happen, would they choose to still be a Jedi? And I think it takes a lot of bravery and strength and honesty to say like, yeah, I would still do that. And I, I think, I think like the first part of that where he's like, absolutely not. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Like his initial thoughts on that were probably him just not thinking too rationally. And then like coming around to understand that actually, no, this is, this is something that means a lot to me. And despite everything that's happened, like I am who I am today because of my experiences. Right. And it's so interesting when you, stack that up aside up against the the fifth brother's point of view in this book which is like when he's reflecting on the jedi mm. he thinks a jedi uh took him from his family you know and tried to give him a life uh, of service to something that's like greater than him like this great equalizer but then he realizes the jedi were just uh made to serve as politicians and uh ignored the fallibility of people easily corrupted you know uh, by power and right. prestige and he's like i hate the jedi like mm. The Jedi, uh, you know, they promised me one thing and they served something else entirely and I hate them. I wish I weren't a Jedi. I wish I never went down that path. Right. And so you have these two characters who are kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to think about within this time period, like a Jedi who became inquisitors and then Jedi who are still connected to the force because they believe in it and they believe in the light because it is the light sort of thing, you know? Uh, and I think it's a commentary too on just like our identity and like uh, who we think we are at our core, you know, because I think sometimes people will try to tell us that we choose to be a certain way or that like, oh, we chose that path. But in reality, it's like, would Cal really have had a choice? No, because that's who he is. He's a Jedi. He's he's a force user. It's who he is at his core. And he can't change that. He can't run away from that. And it's good for him to not run away from that truth, despite all the pain and suffering he's he's seen right and i think there's a powerful statement there of just like unabashedly being yourself and sticking to who you are no matter people around you maybe telling you who you should choose to be right and i think that that um inherent selfness if that makes sense is is just like an important resolution to feel um because there's a sense of i think a sense of cow like everything has, this is, this life has brought me such pain, like such pain and loneliness. Um, but 
that, um, but that he is not any less than because he is living this life because this is who he is. He's not any less of a person. And I'm not going to be one of those people. It's like, everything happens for a reason. You know, he went through that pain for a reason. Um, because like life, life in, in real life and in our fictional lives where all the worlds are created, right? Like life is cruel and it can be cruel and that's, nobody deserves that. Right. Um, but the point, the point being that like who you are intrinsically, deeply, personally, at your very core is, has value and has purpose and has meaning. And I think that is a message that readers can walk away with, um, especially like, especially queer readers, like from this book. And, and I think that's good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that's good. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. I I thought it was a really profound conversation and I just, I just love that Cal stuck to his guns and stuck to like who he truly was and didn't shy away from that. I think it's a, it's a great message as we've said. So um, I think we'll kind of end our discussion on that. And before we wrap up our like book portion here and kind of go into our closing uh, to look forward at survivor, we have a couple of odds and ends as we always do with every book uh, discussion that we do. And uh, Sarah, I will let you kick us off with some of yours. Okay, let's go. Um, oh my gosh. My first one, I have a couple. It's just a funny from Grease is Grease loved Cal. He really did. Like he was family. He felt like the kid's own flesh and blood. Devastating, handsome uncle in a lot of ways. <laughs> Grease is a player. He is just he's, straight he's up. He's a comedy king, honestly. I thought that was a funny, just like, ah, yes, you're my family and I'm just your, your hot uncle. Just yeah. Out here living my life. Glad to have you as a member of the family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, yep. Yeah. I love him. I love him so much. Uh, my, uh, one of my odds and ends was about the shroud. Uh, it's, you know, a personal shielding device that makes the user invisible. And so when, when they're talking with Kiris Lar, who's like, you know, the really wealthy businessman who hates, uh, hates bureaucracy, but is still in politics regardless. He mentions that, the shroud is waiting shipment to the empire's theoretical applications testing facility on edu for decryption and eventual fabrication which we know galen or so will eventually end up on edu i don't know if he's there now because it's still edu i don't know how early in stardust this is but uh i don't know if he's already been taking from his, his farming life yet but yeah edu it's where galen or so dies eventually sad face sad edu rip Speaking of speaking of Karis, though, um, I share a team sentiment with regard to the way the galaxy is handling the empire. Though you likely know me as a prolific entrepreneur and job creator, finally able to do some good in the system, I was once a member of the Alderanian government. I once, or I fled once. Ayo. I realized that the Republic senator Bail Organa, Ayo, was too willing to become Imperial Senator Bail Organa. <laughs> uh, me glares straight into camera. Um, the royal family was never going to take a strong enough stand. That's a really interesting point of view. He's wrong, but like, he's also right. Well, it's, it's funny too, because there's the irony of like how some of the leaders of the rebellion present themselves on the outside, calling him Imperial Senator Bail Organa. We know Bail is like going to be like one of the most diehard rebellion fighters that there were. (laughs) Right, right. Like so, dedicating everything. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I just, you know, me excited about a Bail Organa mention. That's right. Yeah. No, we love Bail Organa. Pay Jimmy Smith's his paycheck uh, for Andor. Every day. This next one here is uh, from Seer's point of view when she's fighting the Inquisitor. Quote, there was a moment, just a moment when Seer was grasping the Inquisitor from behind, hands around his throat, trying to keep him off balance long enough for Cal to get up off the damn ground and get back into the fight when she thought. Ah, this is it. This is what the life of a great Jedi master has come to swinging around on the back of some poor brainwashed kid who deserved better and got far, far worse. Just Mm. like all the stories of the heroic Jedi during the high, high Republic always promised. Wow. So there's like a little bit of dialogue there that we could maybe have, but what do do you make of that (laughs) quote? Maybe we save it. (laughs) (laughs) Like, is she saying that like the stories of the high Republic promised like 
good, but it was actually horrible? Or is she saying like the High Republic promised good? Because to me, it read like the High Republic to her is known as a time of like the Golden Age, but really there were some really bad things that happened during the Golden Age. Like as we know from reading <laughs> Phase One, you know all these Jedi who die at the hands of the Leveler and of the Nile, right? Like those Jedi were promised like the best time ever, but it ended up being pretty tragic. Yeah, I think that's kind of what that's getting at. It's like, or yeah. or or like. Or maybe it's like, we're remembering history as well. The Jedi of the Hyperbook, wow, wow, wow. That means the Jedi life is going to be good. You know, I, I think either way, it's kind of getting to the same point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we, we do love a higher public shout out. We got to say, I was, we I was, I was happy about that one. Most certainly do. Yeah. I think Seer has some opinions. I want to sit down with her over like a beer and just ask her. Like, what are your thoughts on the High Republic? What are your thoughts on the High Republic? Yeah. Which is interesting because we know the Jedi, the Jedi from the Fallen uh, or Survivor trailer is wearing High Republic robes. Don't get me started, actually. Don't, don't. So maybe we will, maybe we will learn a little bit more about Sears thoughts. So we'll, we'll table that one for later though. Anyway, my last one, (laughs) um, going back to my love of the high Republic actually is that I love different representations or different interpretations of the force. And we kind of get a feeling for Cal's uh, experience in the force. Um, you know, he says he has no idea if the force felt the same to everyone. Um, and he had heard a lot of the different ways that the force had been interpreted by, you know, Jaro and Seer, et cetera, et cetera. But for Cal, it was always the same. It was like a deep pool, blackest in its deepest fathoms, uh, swallowing him whole as he dived down, down into it and emerging into a void where color and sound became muted, distant. It was the expression of his consciousness, a brief direct connection to the source of all things, like stretching his arms forward into meditation, settling into and moving through the void that connected every living thing, his ripples spreading out concentrically like interlocking circles affecting the world around him. Now, it's giving me Jimin face if you know, you know, don't worry about it. If you don't, Brad, please don't kill me for bringing up K-pop. Bye. Um, and, but like, it's also giving me, um, one, um, Els or, or man. Yeah. Els so, or man sees it as an ocean. Yeah. As an ocean. Yeah. He wades into. Kind of evokes the imagery too of the, of the skill tree from the oh, game, I think. Oh, it totally does. You know, and like intentionally the, so. And it's good. So I love that. I always love It's giving video game. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have like two quick ones here and, and okay. then we can wrap up. So this next one is about Mercana and Fret. Um, Fret mentions how, you know, it was beautiful once, you know, a real tourist attraction, black beaches, huge oceans, real amazing coral reefs. I saw hollows of what it looked like before the Republic bombed the life out of it from orbit during the Clone Wars, burned the separatists out of their hiding place and took everything else with them. Uh, and Seer mentions like a total eco collapse and, you know, all that's left now is acid rain, quicksand and uh, stagnant pools that breed nothing but toxic gas and uh, it's very interesting to have that uh, perspective mm. put out there about the fact that not perspective i guess but fact that the republic bombed this planet and it's sort of a, a thought to have about the war and the fact that you know we tend to side with the jedi and the republic you know because they're they're the good guys but really that war is so much more gray than it is well, black and white in many ways right and the fact that palpatine played both sides and the republic did a lot of terrible things during the war as well like they they bombed some places you know it's war, war is not war good is war is not good um, it's war not a good is thing. bad generally um yes but it also like brings up um it's giving me victory's price songs from forgotten worlds um and it's also giving me like the first two episodes of this latest season of the bad batch when they go to sereno and you see the people of Sereno yeah. uh, all struggling and hiding because the total collapse of their society and the world. Yeah. Also, yeah. No, totally. It's I, I, I find that uh that commentary about the, the Clone War very interesting mm. whenever it comes up. So I, I appreciated that mention. And my last one here is just uh, a couple of Cal crumbs. Marin crumbs. I know you and I said that we both ship that. Um, yeah. there were some good ones in here. There was like a quote, uh, together they were the light and dark cow was the star that illuminated Marin's shadow. Ugh, love it. Cal, uh, Marin says that he was so sweet. It was, or she thinks he was so sweet. It was kind of annoying. Love it. And also like, there's a moment where she is like bandaging his wounds and like 
healing him and they're getting like really close and he strips I off his shirt so she can like put the don't want to sound on like a maniac but that's some delicious food some some like it is that's the vibe anyway bye <laughs> uh what cal saw when he looked at Marin was beautiful and terrifying all at the same time I love it love it love it so just a couple of good crumbs um for all you Cal, Marin shippers out there. There are many of us. Um, and I wonder how that relationship will evolve in in uh Survivor. I wonder if there will be like a, a blossoming romance there at all. So time will tell. And speaking of uh Jedi Survivor, I guess that's where we can we can wrap up here as we look forward. So how excited are you for the um, for the game? Oh my gosh. How are you feeling? Brad. Besides the fact that it's seventy dollars, probably. Uh no. <laughs> Okay, actually, just kidding. Scrap all of that. I don't have any comments. <laughs> We're not talking about it. I don't think you understand. Okay, today's been a crazy day in K-pop land. Two comebacks I'm very, very excited about are coming out within four days of each other. And then at the end of the next week is going to be this game. And then like four days after that is going to be another comeback that I'm very excited for. How am I supposed to afford all of this? You just keep racking up the credit card balance like I do and just, you know, hope it goes away. Okay. Great advice. Thank you so much. I'll take that into account. Um, <laughs> writes down credit card debt, exclamation point. Yeah. Um, right. Um, but honestly, I am excited about the game. I am not going into it with a ton of expectation um, because I'm trying not to uh, like try not to put too much on it because I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know what story it's going to take us on. And I also, be honest with you, don't know when I'm going to have the opportunity to like actually sit down and play it. So I'm trying not to like put too much on it or put too much on myself to do it. But I'm really looking forward to it. And I think it's going to be devastating, but I'm hoping it's also hopeful. I can't wait for it. I know I'm I'm probably going to put like tens and tens of hours into this game. I think I put about like 60 to 70 into Fallen Order. So that should be a good time. And I do know our boy Claude is back in no, Jedi Survivor. Edit this out of the episode, Brad. We don't need to talk <laughs> about it. I don't know if anybody saw the gameplay footage, but you can see a little Claude lurking in the background in one of the shots. So um, I wonder if he'll be like, you know, our new favorite NPC uh, should be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Claude, the NPC. But no, in all seriousness, uh, I'm very excited. I can't wait to see like where all of the characters have ended up post battle scars. And but yeah, there are just so many things to look forward to between the Sith that's in the trailer, the pawn dude, the Powan dude <laughs> who uh, I don't know, maybe he's from Utapau and we get to go to Utapau in this game. Utapau. Kind of cool. Utapau. Utapau. <laughs> Probably not, though. Uh, but also like the guy in the back to tank, I have more questions about him and then the high Republic Jedi as well, who I want to know everything about. And I can't wait to see maybe, you know, if he's the guy coming out of cryo sleep or whatever, Mm. what would a high Republic Jedi feel about the current state of the world? Like the the galaxy. It's like the, imagine you wake up and it's this meme, you know, like, (laughs) but, but, but really though. (laughs) Yeah. So that, that would be like a really interesting perspective and I I can't wait to play the game, sink many hours into it. Uh, maybe I'll stream it. I'm not, I'm not really sure what my plans are for that quite yet, but, um, it might happen, but I can't wait. I can't wait. We're getting like more Star Wars storytelling and video games are a, uh, they, they are a valuable form of storytelling. Because those stories can be as powerful as anything else, as evident by The Last of Us TV show. Right, right. And, the last <laughs> and video game. game. Um, yeah, based yeah. on the game, that is heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lot to look forward to. Lot to look forward to. Hopefully we don't see uh, Order 66 again, though, because I don't need more pain <laughs> in that regard. Well, on that note. Uh, This is our last episode that we are recording before Star Wars Celebration and probably the last episode that will come out before Star Wars Celebration. So we're kind of in the home stretch here and, uh, you know, stay tuned from us with any updates in the coming weeks for more book discussions, more interviews that we have planned uh, these next couple of months. It's going to be a really exciting time. So make sure you're following us on all of our socials on Twitter and Instagram, uh, YouTube. We'll post everything new there. Um, as well as any exciting uh, plans that we have coming up. And if you'd be so kind, follow us wherever you're listening to the show and leave a five-star written review if you could. Helps other folks find the show and join the discussion. And uh, we appreciate any feedback that you might have. 
Yeah. Uh, we're so grateful that you take the time out of your day to listen to us. Hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, hybrid conversation of Jedi Battle Scars and the Jedi Fallen Order and Survivor Games, a bit of a Jedi trilogy, if you will. Um, we're really also grateful for all of our patrons who do help to make the show happen. So thank you to Ben, Brian, Cheryl, Clay, Deborah, Dylan, Diesel, Emma, Huang, Jennifer, Katie, Knights of Ren, Leanne, Levi, Lucy, Lindsay, Matthew, Rob, Saber Bouquet, Santa, Sky Talker, Stephen, Tom, and Travis. Thank you all very much for your support. We're grateful for you. And we're grateful again for you, listener, whoever you may be, uh, for joining us in this conversation today. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all once again for listening to the show. And until next time, may the force be with you always. Bye. <laughs>